Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hillary. Julian Raab is an expert partner at McKinsey based in Munich, Germany. He leads the McKinsey customer operations practice for Western Europe. I called Julian to explore several recently published McKinsey research papers, primarily focused on CX personalization, omnichannel, the next normal, and digital transformation. Julian gave some great insights based on his recent experience in all of these different areas, and he also talked about the near future for BPO and contact centers. Okay, Julian, thanks for appearing on the, the podcast. Um, now, I know that I saw some research that you recently shared on Omnichannel um, and how Omnichannel should be working. And I think the summary of the research was focus on what truly matters. So, so what, what is a summary of that research? I mean, what is it that you're saying really truly matters? And, and why are so many companies um, still needing to learn this lesson? Thanks, Mark, for having me. Um, it's, it's very nice that uh, I am. You know, I can share a little bit like our perspective on custom experience here. Um, what really matters? That's an excellent question. And that was also one of the reasons why we framed the article on new omnichannel strategy around that. What we realize is that especially in omnichannel, uh, clients and customers are looking way too much into channel by channel and try to resolve customer requests. But what we understood is from all our customer research and also from discussion with clients, that it is extremely important to focus on a handful journeys and to start with these. And to to select these journeys, especially look at two very important dimensions. One is um, how important this journey is to a customer. And secondly, what is the likelihood or the propensity that people use multiple channels? Mm. For example, when your internet is broken, uh, it might be of highest importance to you as a customer. But as your internet is broken, the uh, ability to do a full omni-channel journey is very much limited. So the likelihood that you will pick up the phone and call your provider is pretty high. So we would have said it's something which is extremely important to fix within the channel so that you have a delightful experience, but it's not so important to really think through the whole omni-channel. While, for example, if it's around an onboarding journey where a customer is new to you and needs to really understand your product, we see a lot of people starting in the digital, getting informed, at one point of time switching over Um, calling you or probably starting to chat with you. You have the ability to use robotics in these channels to really guide the customer and potentially not even have the necessity for a customer contact. And really think this through end to end, make it a distinct customer experience. This is something where really comes value to you as a company. And that's why we're saying focus first on the ones that are truly omnichannel And that really matter to the customer. And by experience, looking at all kinds of industries, it's actually two to three journeys and not 20. So that's really, uh, because the next thing I was going to ask you is where where should the executive start if they're thinking of following this advice on Omnichannel? And and I guess it kind of echoes what you were saying just then, that the, the main point here is that you may have many different customer journeys, but only two or three will be really urgent. Exactly. And I would, um, if, if you look at the things that matter and that um, had have a tendency for omni-channel, you can also um, get a lot of interesting insights in how your customer behave. For example, we found in telecom that if somebody is on a dispute my bill journey, um, they, they start a couple of days before looking at the bill and you see some digital engagement before they typically contact you. And this is super exciting because if you know already that a customer might be able or might want to contact you, you can totally different uh, get into contact with him or get a totally different experience because the agent can be prepared. We can pull up all the relevant information already. And then when the customer really is calling, 
we can give them a great experience because the agent can be can be prepared. We are a little bit we know what it is about and so on. Or if we are smart, we can even go for an um, proactive way that we are contacting customers who, for example, um, what, what we also know is that people on the cancellation journey spend a certain time in the digital typically reviewing the contract and cancellation terms. And we can monitor that. We see that as a company. Knowing that, we can actually proactively go to the customer and try to make him different offers and try to find out why this customer is thinking about cancellation and try to prevent that. And that's where we say, think about, about where you believe or where you see within your company a lot of interactions across different channels and where um, you, the customer typically have an emotional distress or focus, very often around bills, very often about a service that is not working. These are the ones that we typically would suggest try to focus first. Mm, and that, that focus is interesting because one of your own recent articles was on hyper-personalization. And, and I know that you said in, in that report um, that possibly the most important customer experience strategy for the next five years will be around personalization. Um, and that's exactly what you were just saying about if you know your customer, you can proactively intervene. Um, and I guess that this was a goal before the, the pandemic happened. Um, so why, why are you saying that it's now taking on a, a new urgency and will be so important for the next few years? The interesting thing is that in the last month, we saw a willingness of uh, customers of our clients um, to experiment with digital or also other channels that well, is not comparable to any time frame before. So we really see an uptake of digital channels. We see an uptake also of automation and of robots. And um, what I personally believe is that this momentum should be used to educate customers on new channels, on new opportunities, and now really build this omni-channel experience on the one hand side, and also to try to deliver an as individual service as possible. What we saw already before COVID as a trend is that actually mostly across all industries, customer experience became a North Star aspiration for most operations. While in the last years or in the past, there was a lot about um, costs, about efficiency within the contact, there's a huge mindset shift already starting like two, three, four years ago towards more delivering and distinct experience in each and any customer interaction. And why is that? For two reasons. One is if you have great quality within a contact, you can avoid additional uh, conversations or additional touch points with the customer, which is in the end even cost positive for you. On the other side, um, um, care channels or, or remote channels become a more and more and bigger share of all customer interactions your customers have with our clients. Yeah? And if this is the case, you understand that these contacts, you really have to use them to create um, a better impression of your company to not only survive in the market, but to create a certain source of distinctiveness. Mm, yeah, and I, I was thinking then about how does this work across retail as an industry? Because many of the digital changes that you've talked about, clearly they can apply to e-commerce, but, but how can we see changes in the, the traditional physical retail environment? I mean, will, will it become normal for us to log in on an app when we actually go into a store? Actually, that's a very good question um, that we had in the last weeks, a lot of discussions. Why? Because obviously stores and retail have to a little bit like rethink what their role in the future will be. And um, just also to say it in front, I'm not the biggest uh, retail expert within McKinsey and my colleagues surely have a, a very uh, comprehensive view on that. But what I observe from all the discussions that I have is that we see an increasing blended experience between digital and physical retail. What do I mean with that? That we have more stores that do not have the full um, product 
um, sortiment that they had in the past. But you have digital screens where, for example, in a closing store, you can try and close this in a digital way and then order it to the store. Or where you can get a certain consultancy on products where probably no one in the store really knows a lot about on a video screen and somebody tells you more about. We saw it actually already in, in banks um, in the last two or three years, for example, in UK, where you had branches without, for example, loan specialists, where the loan specialists had been on a VC with a screen and where you had all set up to really sign your loan physically, but the person consulting you on the loan was not with you, but it was on the other side of a video screen. So this blended environments between more digital environments and more physical environments in stores, this is something what we will surely see in increasing in the future. And um, on your first question, sorry, because I didn't answer that on the, on if, you, if you all have to log in in the app, might be. Might be that if you want to be eligible of certain offers, might be if you want to be steered in a certain way, you have to switch on your phone. We actually see the first things in airports. Not sure if you have been lately to Munich airport, for example, but when you go to the airport and you download the app, yeah, it steers you towards certain ways where you can get food. It gives you um, vouchers where you can get uh, certain things for free or for a cheaper price. It explains you the way. It even has a VR functionality when you walk through that it guides you the way. I think we will see similar things into stores. But until this gets up to scale, don't ask me in specific. My colleagues know it better than I do. I said that um, it will probably a couple of more years until this is really at scale. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask somebody on the retail side when we want to go into more detail. Uh, Happy to connect you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great, thanks. Uh, I mean, some, some, an area that is very specifically in your area is the contact centers and BPOs. Um, and clearly, they've, they've undergone a massive change, you know, moving hundreds of thousands of agents into work from home. How, how is this going to play out now? Are we going to see the blended solution of the contact center plus work at home agents? Uh, that is the, the, the kind of next normal that we, we can expect or, or will we see a gradual return to the contact center? That's a big question uh, that is currently, um, actually that's a, that's a big question in the market and um, this is also the question that we ask all of our clients and also to care leaders. And uh, in May, um, at the end of May, so about one month ago, we did a big poll and asking them, hey, how many people did you have pre-COVID really working in uh, work from home environments? And 84% of all people answered less than 10%. And now then we ask them, okay, what do you believe in future? How many people will work in a work from home environment with at least 30% 30 30 of your people working there? And um, the answer then was about 65%. So it really changes um, um, the whole mindset in this industry, how to think about working from home. And actually, there are three big reasons. First reason is there had been a lot of considerations around data security, how to make it work, and so on, that uh, prevented a lot of players doing it. But through COVID, they needed to do it. They needed to bring it home. They needed to make the people uh, able to work in all kinds of environments. And they see it worked. The second big discussion was around, can people be as productive as they are in an uh, in-home environment versus an in-company environment. And the interesting thing is, when you look at all of the numbers, most people say, yes, topics like AHT increase a little bit, but on the same time, they also say that the utilization of the people increased also a little bit. So in the end, the business case for most had been positive. And um, when, you, when you look at the whole engagement of employees, the absolute majority is happy to have more flexibility how to do it. And the third one was the technology side that had been unsure how to do it, how to uh, equip people and so on. 
And uh, around all of these dimensions, we see a major mindset shift. From all discussions that I have, I believe that most companies will have at least 20 to 30% of the workforce home. And the only question that is now out is what they get in return from the employees. But I see there are very positive interaction today also in Europe between social partners on one side, employees on the other side, and um, business leaders on the third side, how they interact and how they exchange and how they really want to make this happen. I'll give you an example of a big telco in Germany. Um, they brought within one week uh, about 15,000 people into work from home, seven days. And they are now discussing around how to bring people back. And they most likely will move into a model where the people are staying one, two days at home and between three and four days in the office, also a little bit depending on the preferences of the employees and where they will now distribute laptops and remote equipment to everybody so that they are able to work much more flexible than they had been in the past. And on the other hand side, there will be also a work model that allows it from data security, from transparency, from coaching, because obviously all processes need to be changed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I mean, what this feeds into um, is the final question I wanted to ask you, which was around um, some of the digital transformation and innovation that we're seeing because of this crisis. And I know that when you, you researched your doctorate, you actually looked at how innovation can lead to business success. So perhaps one of the more interesting outcomes of this, this crisis period might be that we see some interesting innovation developed very quickly. That's truly true. That's truly true. Um, the interesting, as a, what I found out actually when I did the research, what makes companies more innovative than others, and was writing my book on that, is um, that there are eight different dimensions, but you can cluster them into three bigger buckets. One is the whole process, how to run it. And the interesting thing is, despite the crisis, um, these innovation processes and also the workforce processes, they are still had been in place. Yeah? And there was the second part, which was around leadership. And the interesting thing is that we saw actually an increase in leadership engagement in this crisis. So leadership became aware or was aware that especially in this distributed work environment, it will depend on them to make it work. And so they had been much more engaged than in other situations. For example, we saw a lot of team leaders, also line managers, who had been working a lot on administrative tasks before the COVID crisis. And as soon as COVID started, they really scheduled interactions with all of the employees on a regular basis to do check-ins and so on. And what was planned before, but very often fall up the trap, now really happened on schedule. And it completely revamped also the leadership style. And the third one actually is also the openness and mindset. Through now getting out of the classic environment in the new environments, we, now, we saw, as I already said, or on the customer side, a much bigger openness to experiment. But actually the same on employee side. And many of them had been really excited now for change. And these three elements, this openness and willingness to change, but still having very clear processes how to get things done and an increased leadership engagement, these three are great ingredients for innovation. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. Please take a moment to review the podcast because this helps other listeners to find it. And if you have any suggestions, then get in touch with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm at Mark Hillary with two L's or just search Google for Mark Hillary.